So very, very briefly, we're going to be looking at bed, saddle and tailstock geometry. And I must stress this is not in any detail. This is just a quick tour of these topics. Item number one is bed alignment. How can you design your bed in such a way that it provides good alignment? And secondly, the saddle proportions. How can you um, design the proportions of the saddle, its width and its depth? Uh, in such a way that it is accurate and um, doesn't bind. And then thirdly, how can you design the saddle and tailstock to ensure that you get good access to the work uh, wherever you are along the bed? And these three items are items that you need to think about at the very beginning of your project. Um, if you're drawing this out, if you're laying it out as a scheme, you need to get these proportions right in the very early stages because once you've committed it's going to be difficult to change them. I'd also recommend that you take a little time out and look at uh, um, proprietary lathes, lathes which are manufactured uh, for sale and look at their proportions, what proportions have others used and just try to understand why they are the shape they are. It will um, stand you in good stead as you plan your lathe. So first of all we're going to be looking at uh, bed alignment and uh, I make no apologies for uh, showing this picture rather than my homemade lathe because this gives a better illustration of the issues that we're going to be considering in this video. It's incidentally the, uh, the subject of the uh, drawing which I included at the beginning of the video and uh, throughout the video. Uh, so we're going to use this to set the scene for our discussion today. Now under the heading of bed alignment there are two broad topics I want to cover and that is redundancy and non-redundancy of the structure. And as an example of a redundant structure I have here the Barker bed lathe which I featured in one of my previous videos. And you can see here that the bed is comprised of three bars uh, upon which the saddle slides. And the issue of redundancy is illustrated here because it's clear that if you don't have those bars perfectly parallel, if they're not um, precisely the same dimension along the length, then you're going to get the whole thing binding up unnecessarily. And equally, if you have a clearance, um, then you're going to have a sloppy structure. So this is an example of a redundant bed. And uh, we're going to use this um, uh, as the sort of... Um, uh, um, an example of what we're going to talk about in the next slide. So some of the limitations that I want to consider um, at the very beginning is the idea of redundancy and how it is that a saddle bed arrangement um, is going to provide the uh, lateral or the horizontal location and the up and down or the vertical location. So I'm going to use a few examples here and each of, in each of these examples the bed is shown in blue and the saddle in orange. So let's consider first uh, the vertical location. Well that's clear, that's provided here on this uh, flat, flat section bed by uh, location on the top and underneath and uh, the top surfaces are bigger in area than the ones underneath because most of the force is downwards. So um, that's all straightforward and easily understood. Now when it comes to uh, lateral or horizontal uh, location, uh, you have here uh, the first feature is on the front of the bed adjacent to the apron and the rear of the front shear and you can see that that feature provides horizontal location. So where does the redundancy come in? Well, the redundancy comes in in this design or this layout because it, there is also location across the whole width of the bed. And uh, so that shows you that you have two features both attempting to provide horizontal location and that is redundancy. Why it matters? Well, that will become clear as we go on. Second example of a redundant, a, a redundant um, layout is here. Again, the vertical location is provided by the two V's and the um, underside of the shear of the bed. So that's all very straightforward. Now redundancy comes in here because both V's are attempting to provide 
horizontal or lateral location. So again, we have the idea of redundancy. Now we come to a dovetail section bed and vertical, sorry, horizontal location this time is provided across the flanks of the, of the dovetail. And that um, is straightforward. But horizontal, uh, sorry, vertical location is ambiguous. It is simultaneously provided by the flanks of the shear, uh, by the flanks, the flanks of the the um, dovetail and the top surface, and the flanks of the dovetail and the bottom surface. And that again is an example of redundancy. So there you can see the dovetail opposed by the top surface and the dovetail opposed by the bottom surface. So the question is which of those is providing location? Not clear. Now we come to um, something akin to the Barker bed lathe. Instead of three bars, as was the case there, there are two here. Uh, vertical location is more or less independently provided by both bars. So in the vertical sense, there isn't actually a redundancy. Um, but there is in the lateral or the horizontal sense. Again, which of the two bars is responsible for providing that location? Clearly, both of them are. Now we come to uh, a bar lathe, which has a, um, a circular section and a, horizontal and a rectangular section. Vertical location at the, uh, the front of the bed is provided by the rectangular bar and at the rear, um, horizontal or lateral location is provided by the round bed. And that would seem to be a, a fairly foolproof design. But I've deliberately shown the rectangular section to be elongated, to be wider than it might, than it really needs to be. And that becomes an issue because that also attempts to provide rotational um, stability. But then you have the potential for that to fight against the vertical location um, provided by the round bar. So again, you have redundancy, but of a different kind. So you can see as you look around this chart, you have examples of horizontal redundancy, examples of vertical redundancy, and one example of rotational redundancy. Now here we have um, a classic example of a flat bed. This is my Myford ML7. And uh, this is an example of non-redundant location. You have horizontal location on the front edge of the front shear. You can also see it's provided on the rear edge of the front shear. Um, but there is no location on the rear of the rear shear. There is in fact a clearance there. So this is not a redundant um, layout and um, it's very clear to see uh, where the accuracy of the machine comes from. So now we're going to look at non-redundant redundant examples of location of the saddle on the bed. Our first example is a flat section bed with two shears, front and rear. And the vertical location is provided by the top surfaces of the bed and the underneath sections at the front and the rear. And um, of course, that makes sense to have the bigger surface on top since most of the weight, um, uh, since the weight is bearing down on this and uh, also the cutting forces are mostly downwards. Horizontal location is across, is across the whole width of the bed from front, front to rear. Um, but the point is, um, there is no conflicting location here. Everything is straightforward. The second example is actually the ML7 example. The vertical location is the same but the horizontal location is purely across the front shear. Now, some people feel that this is a better arrangement because it brings um, the, the two surfaces closer together and therefore minimizes the chance of binding. Uh, that's something you might want to think about. So that's the difference between the first example and the second example. But in both examples, uh, the setup is not redundant. Now, the third example is a dovetail section bed uh, with horizontal location across both flanks of the dovetail. 
with vertical location between the flanks and the top surface. Now, uh, of course, it could have been on the bottom surface um, of the dovetail with an extension from uh, underneath the uh, um, from the bed underneath the the saddle. But by having it this way round, it means that the top surface doesn't have a clearance, so there's no chance for swarf to get underneath. That's something uh, to think about. It's also the ways that um, the way that the ML10 and um, various other lathes um, have um, have uh, have adopted this system. Uh, I don't think you'll find any which have a clearance on the top. And then we have the V section bed. Uh, again, the horizontal location is provided purely by one V, and you can see that the second V has a clearance. Uh, so um, that's not providing any location. The vertical location is provided both by the, the V and underneath the shear on the front and um, a flat section of the shear at the back and underneath. And uh, again, this is very clear, clearly um, uh, not redundant. Um, every, every function, every uh, mating surface uh, provides uh, location without competing with any other um, at the same time. And then we come back to the bar section uh, or the bar design. So we have a vertical location provided by the round section at the rear and on the top of the square section and underneath on the corner. Now the difference between this and the previous example, uh, which was a redundant arrangement, is a little bit subtle and it has to do with proportions. And um, the, 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 the difference is that the, the um, square section is narrower and therefore is not able to provide that rotational resistance to compete with the vertical alignment provided by the round bed. You might want to think about that a little bit, but it's a subtle difference. So uh, these are examples of, of uh, non-redundant location. Here is another example of non-redundant location. This is my simple bar bed lathe. Um, just for clarity, the round bar is on the front rather than on the back, as was in my diagram, but it's the same principle. Now, you might think from all of this that redundant location is something to be avoided at all costs. And um, <clears throat> that was, um, that would be my natural instinct is to avoid it. But um, if you look carefully, you will find lathes which do have uh, redundant uh, location of the saddle on the bed and also the tailstock on the bed. And uh, one example of that is a pacemaker lathe. This is an American lathe. Um, I'm sure no longer in production. It looks like it's a 1950s and 1960s design. Um, but uh, if you look carefully, you can see that the the two V's supporting the tailstock. Um, yeah, there are in fact two V's supporting the tailstock. You can see the the uh, covers there on the on the wiper pads. Um, uh, here's a rear view. You can see the same feature, and you can see another two V's, which are dedicated uh, for the saddle. Uh, here you can see. Um, a cross section of the same machine, an engineering drawing, and uh, you can see here the two V's clearly are supporting the saddle, and the other two V's um, have a clearance. So a redundant design. Um, so how do they get away with it when we can't? Well, of course, this comes back to um, accuracy of production and stability of your materials, and um, the confidence that you have in producing a structure which uh, can meet the demands of uh, redundancy. Um, of course, if you can ensure that you have truly parallel features, you can ensure that dimensionally it is accurate and you can ensure that nothing is going to go out of true, then having a redundant design like this does offer you the luxury of greater location and greater wear resistance. But I would, I would uh, suggest to you that in the home workshop, this is not desirable and um, actually could create problems. I've seen one or two designs um, on YouTube of homemade lathes, 
which have redundant location and I, I really don't think it's a good idea. Now we're going to come to saddle proportions and um, this is somewhat related to the uh, bed alignment um, as you'll see. Um, one of the considerations is the is the width of the bed, um, the distance between the front and the rear shear and and sometimes um, lathes are, are, um, are advertised as having a broad bed and uh, that um, in some ways it is an example of uh, a good machine, heavier machine, uh, more material in there, more expensive. Um, but let's see why that is uh, a, a, an advantage. Well, of course, it's going to be difficult um, to ensure that your two ways um, are perfectly parallel. And um, even if they do start out parallel, they're going to wear. And uh, let's, for sake of argument, say that um, there is a wear of X amount and it's the same uh, on the narrow bed and the same on the, the wide bed. So I'd like to illustrate um, what actually happens in practice um, uh, with uh, wear on the bed uh, with a narrow and a broad bed. So with a narrow bed, the angular rotation when viewed from the rear is going to be a lot greater than with the broad bed. Um, all for the same accuracy uh, or the same amount of wear. And um, in an exaggerated um, blown up form, you can see it here. You can see the, the, tool relative, the tool movement relative to the true diameter in each case. The second aspect we need to consider is what I've called longitudinal stability. That is um, looking on the front of the lathe, the ability of the saddle to remain upright uh, even when there are cutting forces um, applied um, at center height. So you see here the tool force at center height and the feed force coming from the rack uh, and pinion or the lead screw and clasp nut. So those two um, forces create a moment which tend to rock the saddle um, if cutting from um, right to left in a clockwise direction. And they're resisted by um, forces on the corners of the saddle provided by the underside of the, the bed and the top side of the bed, as shown here. So again, you can see the length of the saddle along the bed has a function in providing stability. Now, the width of the bed is not everything. Um, you need to think about um, the proportions of the saddle, not just its width across the bed. Um, why is that important? Well, here you have a narrow bed um, and here you have a broad bed, but with the same length along the bed of the saddle. So exactly the same length, just wider across the bed. Now you need to think about the forces at play uh, and um, typically you might have a tool force um, pushing the saddle rearward close to the center line of the lathe. And the force propelling the saddle along, of course, usually is on the front of the bed. Not always, but usually. Either provided by the rack and pinion or by the lead screw and clasp nut. And if you have a, a um, broader bed, a wider bed, it means the, the moment, the turning force, uh, uh, on the bed causing it to twist is going to be greater for the same forces and that means that the forces on the corners which oppose that resistance are also going to be greater uh, so um, you can see that the narrower bed actually results in smaller forces on the corners of the 
saddle where it locates on the bed and that's going to result in less wear so you have a compromise there you have the uh, stability of the broader bed versus the increased um, wear resistance that that brings and uh, that's something to think about so uh, as in all aspects of design it's about compromise it's about weighing up all of the various factors and coming up with the optimum and of course one way to get around that is to have both a wider bed and also a longer saddle along the bed and if you look at um, precision machines tool room lathes you will see that often the saddle is quite long and uh, the proportion of free bed compared with the actual length of the saddle is quite small and on hobby machines you will find often that the length of the saddle compared with the length of the bed is small so you can move the saddle up and down the bed a long way so um, capacity uh, versus accuracy uh, again two factors which can be um, in opposition to each other so this thinking about uh, proportions of saddle and bed and the and the feature of binding so here you have a narrow um, a, a bed with a fairly um, short uh, or narrow saddle and um, what's going to happen of course is that if there's any clearance which of course there will be the saddle is going to rotate and uh, you might be able to measure this on your lathe by putting a clock um, on, on the lathe and traversing the saddle and moving it one way and the other you might be able to detect this, detect this angular movement uh, it's not going to be so much of a problem on a V section bed but it could be on a flat section so have a look at that um, again the narrower your saddle the more this rotation is going to be an issue I remember on my first lathe which was a drum and round bed um, uh, effectively the diameter of the bed and the width of the saddle were about the same it was about square and this rotational problem was very noticeable uh, and of course the rotation is resisted by the corners now here we have uh, two examples of um, different approaches to designing a lathe of course there are opposite ends of the spectrum one is a hobby lathe and the other is an expensive uh, tool room lathe um, the the first is a hobby mat and the second is a dean and smith uh, dean smith and grace lathe but just look at the proportions of the saddle in both cases you can see that the in the tool room lathe the saddle is a much greater percentage of the bed length of the bed and um, in fact it's uh, probably half the length of the bed um, and um, that means that uh, you're sacrificing um, the ability to uh, turn long parts but you're gaining much greater accuracy in the hobby lathe the saddle is very short um, uh, but maximizes the percentage of the bed that you can use now the second example is the center height as a proportion of the width of the saddle and the two examples I'm using here are my Corsica student mark one lathe and my homemade lathe and it's interesting to make a comparison uh, between the two so here you can see um, as I was assembling my Corsica student after refurbishment the width of the saddle you can see that clearly there and then you can see the center height and uh, you can express the the ratio of width of saddle over center height and just scaling it from the from the photograph here unfortunately I can't measure it because my lathe is a long way from where I am at the moment but just scaling it it looks like it's about 1.8 and if we do the same um, with my homemade lathe here's the width of the saddle um, I can do this from drawing because I have the drawings with me and here is the center height and that ratio works out as 1.2 width over center height is 1.2 now you can see um, just from the general proportions you, you can see that difference immediately it's immediately recognizable interesting to measure that ratio and um, I think it would be interesting to compare a number of lathes and see how this ratio varies now the fact that W of C is 1.2 and that is 
quite a low number. Um, it's interesting to note that um, I found that I had to add extensions under the um, under the saddle to uh, both forward and rear um, and towards the headstock and the tailstock and you can just see those underneath the shears and uh, these were uh, blocks which I added to effectively um, increase the width of the saddle. So that's an indication to me that this ratio of 1 over 2 on my homemade lathe was not really adequate. So now we come to item number three, saddle and tailstock interaction. And uh, this is where we need to think about um, these two items, not as separate pieces, but as items which uh, work together. Now, on a lot of lathes, the saddle operates on one portion of the bed. And the saddle operates on a separate portion of the bed. And the primary reason for this is not where, but the primary reason is to provide flexibility in where you can position the two items along the bed. So you can see here that um, we have two separate locations. Now, um, why is this important? Well, uh, with um, some designs, um, even if you can have center clamping to clamp the tail, the, uh, the uh, tailstock, which we'll come to again later. Uh, if uh, you have a very cheap design, you might want to not have any extensions on the saddle, just a plain rectangular section like this in plan view. And what's the limitation on that? Well, the limitation is um, you can bring the tailstock um, up close to the work only if you have a very narrow uh, saddle and they may, that may not provide adequate stability as we've seen in some of the previous slides. Now I got around that problem by having extensions on, front, on the front of the saddle but I couldn't have them on the rear because I didn't have a gap in the section of the bed and again we'll come back to that issue a little later. So um, the ideal solution to this is to have extensions on the saddle to the front and the rear and uh, to have a narrower center section which is adequate for supporting the cross slide and um, that enables you to neatly bring the tailstock up close to the work and yet have a very stable and robust saddle with lots of surface area and lots of stability and um, uh, to provide accuracy. So you can see here on um, in this slide um, a photograph from Debbie Novriel's lathe, uh, which I featured in one of my previous videos. Um, and he doesn't have a center section in, in his bed. Um, it's built up from bar stock. And similarly, my lathe is built up from bar stock, the one on the picture on the left there. And the consequence of this um, in our layouts is that there is no hollow center section to the bed. And um, that means that the saddle and the tailstock operate on exactly the same portions of the bed. In other words, the, the, the entire width of both those lands or those um, ways. Now that means that you can't have any extension on the saddle to the rear, as you can see on my design. And um, that means that uh, you encounter the problems we just covered. But the other problem is tailstock clamping. And uh, that means that you have to be a bit more creative in how you clamp the tailstock. Now some tailstocks, uh, which go right across the bed, if they are on dovetail sections, it's very straightforward. You can just clamp across the width and that locks the saddle both um, transversely, horizontally and vertically very effectively. But um, if you don't have a dovetail section, as I don't, and Debbie Novriel doesn't have either, then um, you have to clamp on the front and the rear. Uh, 
Uh, if you just clamp across the width, uh, there's danger of the, not only danger, it's going to happen. The saddle is going to lift, so the tailstock is going to lift um, as you um, operate it. So you need to clamp firmly um, from the front and the rear, and uh, that's a bit cumbersome, to be honest with you. Um, I'd like to try and find a solution to clamp this with one lever, one operation, and I'm going to try and think about that a little more. But it's not straightforward. Now, um, Earl Young, in his homemade lathe, again using bar stock, has um, avoided this issue. I think he used a published design. You might want to look that up. But he has a hollow bed, as is clear from these two views. The view under the fixed steady clearly shows a clamp uh, pulling up through the center of the bed. And you can see on the right hand picture there in front of the yellow tailstock that the bed has a hollow section. And it looks like there's a clamping feature that goes right through the tailstock. That, of course, is uh, a neat and effective way of um, clamping your tailstock. And, and I think it's, uh, it's one of those issues that you might sort of think about, well, I'll solve that problem later. But actually, it's an issue that's worth thinking about right at the very beginning. A tailstock is used a lot, and the effectiveness of its clamping is really important.